We're going to keep moving. Constitution forbids no ex post facto law shall be passed. Ex post facto is out of the aftermath. It's Latin. Also, I think of ex post facto as after the fact. I think a lot of people say the law punishes people for actions that they did or, uh, before the law, before the new law. You can't punish somebody, for example, in 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act. So they criminalizing marijuana. However, if someone dealt it before 1937, they can't be punished for it. So if somebody did uh, drugs before they became illegal, like talk about the uh, the uh, United States narcotics laws that really come up in the 70s under Nixon, if somebody was selling or dealing certain drugs that weren't illegal at the time, and then it did become illegal, you can't arrest them for past behavior. Also, some other questions are, uh, I think we hear a lot of misinformation about things like guns, People will say, oh, no, the government's going to take our guns if they outlaw them or they make restrictions, and that's actually not true. If you make a law today that would say that you can't own guns, under the Constitution, unless we amend the ex post facto clause, the Congress cannot, uh, they can't make a law to take your weapons away for some, when you already have them. So they're kind of grandfathered in, and you can see this with even state laws and cars and things like that, that... If somebody's a 57 Chevy, the federal government can't give you a fine for owning a 57 Chevy or a state government and then uh, try to repossess your car or take it away from you because it was built and it was legal at the time. Now we have laws that, yeah, of course, a 57 Chevy is not going to pass uh, admissions in, in, uh, inspections, but then they can have some safety regulations, but for the most part, there has to be a lot of exceptions on cars and buildings that were built way before a law, like the American Disability Act of 1989. All right, here's another question. After the fact, especially a law that makes punishable as a crime an act that was done before the passing of the law and that was innocent when done, identify the term which best reflects an above quote. Is it A, ex post facto, B, bill of attainer, C, judicial review, or D, jurisdiction? And the answer is ex post facto. So owning things or doing behaviors that are against the law now, but, but before the law was actually enacted, you can't go back and punish somebody for that or take take their property. However, as soon as the law is made, then yes, they can. They can arrest you for dealing marijuana or so forth and so on. Okay, legislative branch. Now, this is just an idea that's in the Constitution we need to know. Uh, for constitution purposes, Congress may not pass bills of attainer. So some of the things they can't do is they can't make ex post facto laws and they can't write what are called bills of attainer. Laws that find people guilty of a crime and sentence them to prison without a trial. So Congress can't pass a bill and then send somebody to jail. Directly to jail without going to the judicial branch. You still have your due process under the judicial branch. Okay, and the president can't execute it. So, choose the best example of a bill of attainer. This is a little bit harder. A, the president signed a bill which would make entering into the country illegal. All individuals caught would be tried and deported if necessary. B, the president signed a bill which would make entering the, the country illegally a federal crime. All individuals caught would be sent to prison without a trial. C, Congress passes a bill which would not uh, would make entering this country illegally a federal crime. All individuals caught would be would be immediately tried. D. The president has asked Congress to pass a bill, which would make entering this country illegally a federal crime. All individuals caught would be provided an attorney for the deport de deportation hearing. Take a minute. Which one is a is definitely a best example best example of a bill of attainer. Okay, and that was B. The president signed a bill which would make entering this country illegally a federal crime, and all the individuals caught would be sent to prison without a trial. Prison without a trial. So, to go back, the president signed a bill, but who writes the bill? If it's a bill of attainer, and all bills come from Congress, therefore, it is a bill of attainer, which would make entering the country illegal. He just signs off on it. A federal crime. But the key to the Bill of Tainers, all individuals caught would be sent to prison without a trial. 
That is very, very important. That is our due process. So the Founding Fathers are really trying to protect protect our due process under the law and they were that is one of the things that they are very much aspired uh by the british in the the magna Carta that you have the people have a right to a process to prove they're innocent and we talked about things about habeas corpus like bring the body to court and actually tell you what you're charged with so they don't want that suspended under pretty much any circumstances okay they also have the power to the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause is that the United States Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among several states and and uh, Indian tribes. So if it's between states, it's under the Commerce Clause. If it's between nations, it's Commerce Clause. And if it's with Indian tribes, and the reason that's important is because, for example, Cher- the Cherokee have a nation. So a nation is almost an independent area group where they have, so they have exceptions to some laws and they regulate themselves. So if you go down to parts of the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, that territory, because of the treaties signed with the indigenous Americans, is theirs. So like even federal government can't even really enter those zones or without uh, agreements with the Cherokee Nation themselves because they have a lot of autonomy uh, because we signed an actual contract, our treaty with them, saying we would allow that. Very, very important case that has to do with this is the United States versus Lopez, 1995. Congress may not use the Commerce Clause to make a possession of a gun in a school zone a federal crime. So this is very important. This this case in a lot of ways is the counter to McClutchin versus Maryland. McClutchin versus Maryland was actually Marshall giving the federal legislative branch more power to execute with things that they consider necessary and proper. On the other side of this, you have United States versus Lopez, where again, the topics itself just seems kind of very small in comparison to everything else that we deal with. But it's a very big implication. So it's the idea that the legislative branch argued or created a law using the Commerce Clause that they could regulate something like guns that are traded over states to not be allowed around school zones within X amount of feet, okay? And they argued, made this argument. And when it went up to the Supreme Court in 1995, a predominantly conservative court said, this is actually not covered under the Constitution. So when they did this, what they actually did to the Commerce Clause, they said that they, at first it was argued that the, the, it's about guns, that the guns themselves are First Amendment right. Therefore, people can carry guns and, and have guns within a school, a public school zone. It's n- the safety issue is not as important as the individual civil liberties issue within the, the Bill of Rights. But it's bigger than that. Because if you read into it, what it did to commerce's power is it shrank it. So now it's more questionable. Um, just because Congress says something is necessary proper... Um, can the courts step in and cut back on what they see as necessary proper to actually execute or to to, to get their uh, explicit powers out? What implied powers do they have actually shrank or shrunk at this time? In this case, really changes everything. Very, very important case that we really need to know. United States versus Lopez in 1995. Okay. They also have the power of what's called the full faith and credit clause, but they're limited here. So their their job is to oversee and to validate uh, the full faith and credit clause, which they, it says that public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state have to be recognized. You have to respect them. So a good example would be if it's not in the Constitution, um, this is where it gets confusing. Something like marriage was not in the Constitution. So full faith and credit, who is in charge? Who has the power to create marriage licenses? Well, states. So when you get married in Missouri, what happens to your license if you move to California? Can California be like, no, 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 we don't recognize Missouri marriage license? And the answer is no. That's not true. So under the full faith and credit clause, you have to give full faith and credit to a Missouri marriage license, just like a driver's license. If I have my driver's license in Missouri and I'm driving in Michigan and a police officer pulls you over, they can't give you a ticket or consequences for having a Missouri driver's license because Missouri, Michigan's driving laws are stricter, or you're supposed to, or it's harder to get a license there. They have to give full faith and credit to our state laws, and 
and that also goes back to the Congress has to to validate those laws unless they create a law that supersedes it under the Supremacy Clause or the, it violates the Constitution. This applies to laws and judicial rulings as well. So if a state law or ruling, this is very important, on something should be given full credit and faith as long as it does not uh, try to supersede federal law created by Congress or the United States Constitution. And that is really important. So if they rule on something that's not federal, like a marriage dispute would be a good one. So say that somebody's getting divorced and they try to take it up to the federal law and argue it's this issue or not, they're, it's probably just going to be rejected and sent back to the state courts because it's not going to go federal. Uh, I was talking to um, a guy that works for the federal courts. And he said probably most of the federal court issues that, are, that they have, or a lot of federal court issues they have, uh, that they deal with in St. Louis downtown is the extra, their civil liberties issues, civil rights issues, like violations under prison law. Like prisoners have a lot of civil rights violations that they, they try to get to, to go outside of the state government and judicial branch to pursue what they feel are civil rights issues, like where their right to um, their right to be treated equal under the Fourteenth Amendment is being violated. Everybody's even argued there's been arguments under the Fourteenth Amendment because you, that's the one clause that's you know part that says under the Fourteenth Amendment they can actually um, they can with that exception they can actually take away some of your freedom to to even work. You work for free and Work without pay is considered slavery outside of prison, as we know, uh, under the 14th Amendment. But in prison, it gets a little bit more hazy on what the rights are. However, they still have rights in prison. You still have a right to eat. You still have a right to sleep. Big questions would be something like self-containment or putting somebody in you know, the hole and locking them up. Is that against their civil rights? These are really good questions. Is that cruel and unusual punishment under the 8th Amendment? That's a very good question. At what point is it cruel and unusual versus it's allowed? It's very good questions. And who protects the rights of prisoners is probably federal courts because state courts are going to probably be much more supportive and lenient of the state penal systems. Okay, let me move quick. This is very quick. We're just going to go over some positions. So Speaker of the House is the most powerful person that presides over the House. Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House. And actually, in terms of uh, if the President would even even pass away it goes pres the vice president takes over the vice president pass away the speaker of the house takes up uh to becomes president at that point that's how powerful she is she's super powerful because we'll talk about congress uh and the house of reps is definitely more powerful than the senate the legislative branch has two houses a bicameral system and we've talked about that before under the Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise. Congress or the legislative branch is made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate. We know that. This is what makes Nancy Pelosi so powerful and the Speaker of the House. They are in charge of all revenue bills must start in the House of Reps. Boom. That's big. So if it has to do with money or spending, it has to start in the House of Reps. Now, do all bills have to start in the House of Reps? No. And I've even been taught that incorrectly over the years. If if it does not have to do with revenue, it could start in the Senate, and then it has to word for word be sent to the, to the House of Reps, and then they could sign it off on it, and then the bill goes to the President, and they could sign in the law. But most laws start in the House of Reps, because if they have to do with revenue, which most things do have to do with some kind of revenue or spending, they start in the House of Reps. So if you think about the budget, when the President proposes a budget, to it has to really start in the House of Reps, under what's called the Ways and Means Community. So remember, revenue is a Ways and Means Committee. Revenue is money or spending. Commerce Clause, Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce within foreign nations among several states and with Indian tribes. We talked about that. Another important case you need to know about that is Gibson versus Ogden in 1824. The Commerce Clause, I don't want to go into all the details of this case, but basically it was about shipping uh, in New York State. It basically, one of the biggest fights is over the waterways. The Commerce Clause has provided the basis for sweeping congressional power over a multitude of national issues. So if it's an issue that affects the nation's interests, they could regulate under the Commerce Clause. So 
if one shipping company and another shipping company for another state are fighting over waterways, the federal government could step in and regulate it under the Commerce Clause. And this actually, water is actually one of the biggest things that probably they have to deal with under the Commerce Clause because there's always battles over water rights. Farmers want water rights so that they can take the water and, and water their crops. Shipping companies want water rights so that they can move their products. Um, travel companies, I mean, there's just a lot of importance in clean water and who has access to the water. I'm going to keep going now. Only the House of Representatives may initiate tax laws and spending bills. House of Reps is, that, again, it has to go back to the, it has to start in the House and Ways Committee that oversees taxing and spending. Um, I think you have a pretty strong argument the House and Ways and Means Committee is the most powerful committee in Congress. So if there is a committee that a congressman or woman wants to be on, it's the House Ways and Means Committee. Think about it. Any company, any person, anybody that wants a bill that is going to cost the government money or spending, they are going to need to talk to the members of the House Ways and Means Committee. And a lot of times they're going to lobby them. So they're really, really important. Now, another important committee, and maybe the second, if not one of the most important, is the Rules Committee. It's in charge of the House procedures and how long a bill is debated. Well, that doesn't sound like the biggest deal, but it's pretty, very, pretty, pretty important because the Rules Committee is in charge of the House of Reps. How long, um, how long something can be debated or on the floor could really affect its, uh, its media coverage, whether or not it gets a lot of coverage. Uh, it could affect. Uh, how long the arguments are so people could challenge it. They could they could cut the bill as short as possible to make it hard to vote on. There's a lot of ways that they could approach this by sticking the bill on the floor for a longer period of time. It might be could do the opposite. It could make it it could make it more likely to pass or less likely to pass. It depends on the situation, and that's why a rules committee is a very important committee you want to be on. Now the Senate has only amending powers on revenue bills, so they can only change a revenue bill they cannot present it now here's the good news for the senate if they amend or change a revenue bill it goes back to the house of reps and if the house of reps cannot create what's called a conference committee with them where they figure out their differences and they both and they both have to write the bills exactly the same it has to be the same exact bill verbatim if they change words uh, it could make the meaning of the bill a lot different. So I know that the of and the and 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 ours in our mind are just very small grammatical issues, but in legality and law, it's a big deal if you charge you change an of to a the then, because that can mean a lot and can be interpreted very complicated many different ways, and when it's actually executed as a law. So if they change it and they amend it, it goes back to the House, and then it comes back to the Senate, and then if they change it again, it can go back and forth. But they cannot actually write anything that has to do with revenue. Very important. Now, the House of Reps is the lower house quickly. They have 435 members. Does not change. Each district has one member representing the population of each district in the house. We've said that's about 900,000 people, close to a middle million per rep, but a little bit less because there's 435 members. That number has been stuck for quite a while. Could change, but we would have to make laws to change it. Um, but they just keep redistricting. The majority leader is Nancy Pelosi. She's a, we just talked about Speaker of the House. She's also the the party member in line. She keeps the party members in line. She helps determine political policy, party legislative agenda. She's super duper powerful. She's probably the most powerful person in the Democratic Party presently. She talks to her members and gets them together. Um, and you could even see that when uh, Trump did his, um, his State of the Union speech and some of the Democrats were kind of speaking out. She was like kind of like trying to, to calm them down or keep them respectful. She made some gestures. The minority leader is the Republican, Kevin McCarthy. He keeps the minority party members in line and helps determine the minority party, which in this case now it's the Republicans' legislative agenda. Or move quick. Majority whip is Steve Scales is in charge of the House the Majority Leader. Uh, he's second to the, the, majority le the Majority Leader. The Minority le Whip is Steeny Hoyer is the second in charge. These are kind of like the assistants. It's, it's second to back it up the Speaker of the House and the uh, Minority Leader. 
Okay, so let's real, real quick at our representatives in the House of Reps in St. Louis. You can see the map in the bottom right-hand corner. So District 1 is really small. It's mostly St. Louis City and North County. And the reason it's so small is because it's very densely populated. Okay, And then 2, and that is uh, Lacey Clay is our representative if you live in St. Louis City or North uh, County. Now, if you live in District 2, it's in West County, St. Charles, South County, parts of Jefferson County, parts of Mid County are split between 1 and 2. It just depends on where you're at. You'd have to actually look it up in some cases, unless uh, it's pretty clear other cases. And that's Ann Wagner. Now, Lacey Clay is a Democrat. He's a very powerful uh, man in the Historically Black Caucus. And his, the reason he's his name is well known is his father was bill clay he's the guy that climbed on top of the arch with uh, uh some uh, i can't remember uh some other civil rights leaders to protest the fact that they were in fact um building the arch with almost uh, i believe it was 100 percent white labor at the time he thought that was unjust the african americans should be able to build be at work building the arch so his father was a civil rights leader and he's been seen by many as a civil rights leader as well um, and then District 2 is Ann Wagner. She's more of a conservative. Uh, she's seen as more conservative, um, straight up and down uh, female representative. And she is, she's up until recently, she's been kind of an unseen, unheard rep. She's just kind of assumed she'd win every election. And actually, the last election, she really got challenged by a Democrat. And until then, she really had almost about 60% of the vote. So she really didn't have to worry. But it seems that some of the congressional movements have changed. So maybe parts of West County and Mid County or areas have become more Democrat. And also because she hasn't been seen, she's been more challenged. Lacey Clay on the other side, he's been challenged by a social Democrat, uh, Cory Bush. But he's he's so the district is cut so well in his favor. It's probably you know next to impossible to knock him out of all his office. He's been in office so long. Now, you can see the rest of the state. You have huge chunks of land in eight. Sixth is gigantic. Fifth's not that big, though, because fifth got Kansas City in it. But you think about just one and two, there's about 900,000 in each area. Wow. But then the rest of the state, look at that. I mean, almost the entire northern part of the state is to make one district up there. You know, seven's a little bit smaller because Springfield's there. Four's got... I believe Columbia is in four, so that's still not that many people, though. But eight and six are just ginormous territories of land. And it tells you that there's not that many people there. It's really spread out versus Kansas City and St. Louis City. Okay. I want you to identify which phrase best describes the Great Compromise. We're kind of reviewing here. Going back over the beginning of the year material. Was it A, a bicameral congressional holding that powers of the outline of the Articles of Confederation. B, a bicameral Congress, whereby re representation would be based on the state's population. C, the will of the majority within each state determine the number of representatives and senators. Or D, a bicameral Congress, the House, based on the state population. The Senate represents would be equal for each state. Okay, the answer was D, a, bi, a bicameral Congress. The House is based on a state population. That's why in Missouri, you can see our representatives are so cut up so far. The Senate representatives would be equal for each state. Okay, so there's two senators for each state, and then House representatives is cut up amongst 435 representatives, and that's going to be redone under the census in 2020. We're going to see... Uh, what's the new district's going to look like probably next year. Okay, we're going to stop there for today, and then we'll go into how a bill becomes a law. Uh, thank you so much for being with me. Have a great one.